the, the simplest and sort of preliminary way to start applying neuroscience to the understanding of childhood development and poverty is to say, okay, you know, we, there's a mountain of data saying, you know, poor children have lower IQs. Poor children have more, you know, externalizing behaviors, internalizing behaviors. They're unhappy. They get into trouble with the law. They're less likely to finish school, you know, all this kind of stuff. But there isn't any IQ center in the brain. There isn't any trouble with the law center in the brain, right? These phenomena emerge from the interactions, and remember all those beautiful fiber tracts that uh, Jim showed you, these interactions between these different systems of the brain, including self-regulatory systems, um, executive function, including the emotional systems of the um, limbic system, and, you know, and so forth. The only thing I'd emphasize here is the fact that, again, children really start off in infancy being totally dependent on their parents to the point where they can actually self-regulate. They still need help and assistance from their parents, but they're now navigating the world, and they're able to kind of do a little bit more on their own every day as they learn and develop. But that's all usually done within a secure, nurturing environment. A lot of times what the parents are doing is what the infant can't do yet because they don't have the motor control, they don't have the ability to focus, which is, you know, the parents does do physical actions for them, verbal communication, and directing attention. The example I would use here is literally from infancy onward, you can have the soft uh, covered uh, cloth books and be reading to your infant. The infant doesn't know it's a book. They don't know what you're doing. They're, you know, at most they're going to mouth the book. But you're starting to model that behavior of what a book is, how you hold it, and the importance and love of reading. It really can't start too early. But then as you get into the infant toddler, uh, the successful parent or caretaker is sensitive to the child's cues, responds to children's distress, and takes advantage of simple everyday activities to stimulate learning. Again, now that same child is on your lap, you're reading to them, they still can't read yet, but at the same time they can start turning pages. Sometimes what they will do is they will want the same story over and over again. It promotes a sense of mastery, and I remember my two and a half year old nephew would say, I'm gonna read this book to you. And he got it out, and he starts telling me the story, and I'm thinking, wait, he couldn't really be reading this. He'd memorized it, and he knew enough about what was in each of the pages that if you didn't know better, you would say he was actually reading the text. It's that sense of mastery that children can develop. Okay, scaffolding with an infant and toddler. And again, scaffolding is key. What we're talking about there is taking something they've already mastered and getting them to the next level. Again, in book reading, really encouraging them to hold the book and then you know, looking at pictures, naming the picture, two words, looking at those words, learning what those words are, sounding them out, helping them develop uh, that, that kind of ability with their language and preliteracy skills. You know, you're modeling how to read all that time. You're allowing the child to hold the book, turn pages, even tell you what's going to happen in the story next. You're giving feedback. That's great. You know, Curious George is going to do that now. Or what do you think, you know, the man in the hat is going to do? All those things. The point being, it's this serve and volley you know, where the child is doing something, the parent is sensitive to the cues, doing something back, and they get that reciprocal dance back and forth going. Okay, um, again, research has shown that successful scaffolding results in healthy brains ready to learn, faster rates of language and learning, task persistence, increased self-control. Um, again, all the things that you want when you're trying to produce a child who can function on in the world on their own. You know, they can start going to uh, childcare, preschool, things of that nature. And they can do things. They know when the parent or the teacher says, use your words, they know what that means. Don't just grab for somebody else's toy, ask them for it. Don't just say, I'm hungry, you know, go over and, and shout it out, go over and do so appropriately. Stress hormones can shape the developing circuitry of the brain, especially the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. Again, that executive function control tower that I showed you in the brain slides. What happens there is it really can have a dysregulating effect because again, remember all those primitive things, that fight or flight? 
when you're in a really a stressful overload situation, you're a very young child, it just becomes overwhelming. And when you don't have a parent there to help mediate that stress, it's even more so. And in those conditions, learning, those connections really aren't going to be made. Uh, the psychological stress associated with growing up in poverty can impair, impair early learning abilities affecting school readiness skills. One of the things I want to emphasize with that is stress isn't always bad. But what you really see in these cases is often inappropriate stimulation and overstimulation and understimulation in other areas. Um, you go into some of these homes, the TV is on all the time at really loud levels. It's inappropriate content for the child, but it's literally so loud and grabby the child attends anyway, even though they have no idea what's going on, and it's disruptive of their learning. Um, you also get things, on the other hand, that's also the case, Again, you won't see books in the home. Books are expensive. If you happen to be a non-English speaker, books are even more expensive in another language. You're not going to see them as much. You're not going to see those reading behaviors. So nurturing and supportive home, childcare, and preschool environments can help buffer this stress and promote adaptive behaviors.